prepare me a bath, O Roman, for tomorrow I will bathe in Dara. A perpetual source of friction between the Roman and Sassanid Persian empires arose from the necessity of guarding the Caspian Gates, one of the few routes through the Caucasus, often traversed by the Scythian hordes when carrying their devastations to the south. Originally, the Romans controlled the pass, but eventually the Persians seized it from them, but the cost of maintaining a garrison there put pressure on the Persian treasury, and they began to demand payment from the Romans to guard the pass. The Romans started to make gains in the area under Justin, and some Persian vassals started to defect to the Roman camp. Kavod now seriously considered an invasion. He sent word to the Emperor Justin that he would consider peace on one condition. Kavod's favorite son was named Khosro, and he wanted him to inherit the throne, but Khosro had older brothers who would contest the claim. His proposal to Justin was that the Roman Emperor formally adopt Khosro, that way nobody could contest his claim if it meant certain war with Rome. Both Justin and Justinian were open to the idea, but the quaestor Proclus quickly intervened, pointing out that if Khosro was formally adopted, he would stand to inherit the crown of the Romans also. The Romans found an evasive way to maneuver out of the pact, a delegation was sent to meet with a group of Persians near the city of Nisebis. Khosro himself joined the delegation and expected to be escorted to Constantinople for his formal adoption. The representatives of both empires met, and the atmosphere was tense. The Persians, against their instructions, began taunting the Romans about besting them in Lazica in the Caucasus. The Romans announced that the emperor could not adopt a foreigner legally, but only through force of arms. This was taken as an insult by the Persians, and the meeting ended abruptly with Khosro returning to his father, vowing vengeance for the insult. War now became inevitable, and both sides began to prepare. The Iberians who lived in modern Georgia were longtime vassals of the Persians, but due to their Christian faith, had decided to defect to Rome when Kavad tried to enforce Zoroastrianism on them. Justinian responded by sending two generals, with a large sum of money, to raise mercenaries among the Huns, who inhabited the northern shores of the Black Sea. The ensuing war was fought half-heartedly by both sides, with raiding and skirmishing being the norm, and pitched battles being the exception. Without any further improvement in the war effort, Justinian handpicked two officers from his household to take charge in Pers Armenia. Their names were Sitas and Belisarius. After a couple of successful months, Belisarius was transferred to a more important position in Mesopotamia, commander of the garrison at Dara, the premier stronghold of the Romans. It was here that he received that future historian Procopius as his legal and administrative advisor. It is due to Procopius's accounts of the wars that Justinian's reign is one of the most well-documented. It was at this point that Justin passed away, who ruled for just over nine years, and Justinian became sole ruler. A general named Lysolarius was the man who held command of the East during this time. He made a foray into Persia in the vicinity of Nisibis, but he managed this so unskillfully that his entire army was seized with fear and fled back to Roman territory without ever seeing a Persian. Justinian took immediate action and fired Lysolarius and promoted Belisarius in his stead. The emperor's first task for Belisarius was to build a fort at Mindo between Dara and Nisibis. As soon as Kavad heard of its construction, he ordered Belisarius to destroy the fort, or the Persians would destroy it for him. The Persian king sent a large army to stop the construction. Information on the impending attack was immediately sent to Justinian, who countered it by sending another army, led by the brothers Cutesis and Bootsis. They met the Persian army before they reached the construction site. The Persians, under more experienced leadership, crushed the army and captured Kutsis. The fort couldn't be saved, and the Romans beat a hasty retreat to Dara. After the disaster, Justinian promoted Belisarius to Magister Militum of the East and authorized him to levy an army of the greatest possible strength. In this task, he was joined by Hermagenes, a confidant of Justinian. 
peace was bandied about for months until the Romans received word that a large Persian army was heading right to Dara. In a short time, a taunting message was brought to Belisarius from Perozes, the Persian commander, charging him to prepare a bath in the town in preparation for his arrival the following evening. Belisarius had about 25,000 men with which to defend Dara. He decided to confront the Persians on the field, so he set up within a stone's throw of the wall of Dara. The Roman army consisted of about 25,000 men. Belisarius and Hermogenes posted themselves in the rear. Immediately in front of them was ranged the main body of their troops in a long line, alternating squads of horse and foot. A little ahead of these, at each end was stationed a battalion of 600 Hunnish mercenaries. On either wing of the center sat about 3,000 cavalry. Belisarius had a trench dug in the center. Additionally, Belisarius placed 300 men behind a hill on the extreme left in hiding in wait for an ambush. When the Persians established themselves on the field, they were perceived to be much greater in number than the Romans, amounting to around 40,000 men. Perozes drew his forces up in two lines, with the intention of switching out those in the front when they became exhausted by troops from behind. The wings were composed of cavalry, and the famous band of immortals was stationed on the left flank to face the Roman right. Perozes himself led from the front, supported by the heaviest mass of combatants. Procopius gives us an account of what happened before the battle began. But one Persian, a young man riding up very close to the Roman army, began to challenge all of them, calling for whoever wished to do battle with him. And no one of the whole army dared face the danger, except a certain Andreas, one of the personal attendants of Buzis, not a soldier, nor one who had ever practiced at all the business of war, but a trainer of youths in charge of a certain wrestling school in Byzantium. This man alone had the courage, without being ordered by Buzis or anyone else, to go out of his own accord to meet the man in single combat. And he caught the barbarian while still considering how he should deliver his attack, and hit him with his spear on the right breast. And the Persian did not bear the blow delivered by the man of such exceptional strength, and fell from his horse to the earth. Then Andreas, with a small knife, slew him like a sacrificial animal as he lay on his back, and a mighty shout was raised both from the city wall and from the Roman army. But the Persians were deeply vexed at the outcome and sent forth another horseman for the same purpose. This horseman came up alongside the hostile army and, brandishing vehemently the whip with which he was accustomed to strike his horse, he summoned to battle whoever among the Romans was willing. And when no one went out against him, Andreas, without attracting the notice of anyone, once more came forth. So both rushed madly upon each other with their spears and the weapons, driven against their corselets, were turned aside with mighty force, and the horses, striking together their heads, fell themselves and threw off their riders. And both the two men, falling very close to each other, made great haste to rise to their feet but the Persian was not able to do so easily because his size was against him, while Andreas, anticipating him, for his practice in the wrestling school gave him this advantage, smote him as he was rising on his knee, and as he fell again to the ground dispatched him. Then a roar went up from the wall and from the Roman army as great, if not greater, than before. And the Persians broke their phalanx and withdrew to Amodius, while the Romans went inside the fortifications, for already it was growing dark. Thus, both armies passed that night. It was now almost nightfall, and both armies withdrew. The next day, Perozes was reinforced with an additional 10,000 soldiers. Shortly after noon, the Persians began the battle by letting loose a shower of arrows until their quivers were exhausted. The wind was against the Persians, so the Romans didn't suffer any more than they inflicted. On its cessation, several thousand Persians bore down on the left wing of the Romans. The 600 Huns held in reserve on the left charged the Persian flank, and simultaneously, the 300 men hidden behind the hill charged down the slope and fell on the Persians from behind. The Persians became panicked and began to flee. When the Romans took the offensive, 
and slew 3,000 before the Persians could make it back to their lines. Considering it unwise to proceed too far and retired to their original positions. The Persian left wing, including all of the immortals, charged the Roman right and succeeded in pushing them back to the walls of Dara itself. Belisarius, seeing his right wing hard pressed, ordered the Huns that just returned from their pursuit to merge with the 600 Huns stationed there originally, along with Belisarius's personal guard. He then sent the new combined force right into the Persian flank. The Persians, as a result, were cut in two. Among these were the Persian standard bearer, who was slain on the spot. This threw the Persians into further panic, and they began to run for their lives. From every side, the Romans rushed to slay their enemies, who became encircled. Again, we turn to Procopius. And the Romans, having made a circle as if it were around them, killed about 5,000. Thus, both armies were all set in motion, the Persians in retreat and the Romans in pursuit. In this part of the conflict, all the foot soldiers who were in the Persian army threw down their shields and were caught and wantonly killed by their enemy. However, the pursuit was not continued by the Romans over a great distance. For Belisarius and Hermogenes refused absolutely to let them go farther, fearing lest the Persians through some necessity should turn about and rout them while pursuing recklessly. For on that day the Persians had been defeated in battle by the Romans, a thing which had not happened for a long time. It was a stunning victory for the Romans, and Belisarius in particular, who had not yet even turned 30. For the rest of the war, the Persians avoided pitched battle with the Romans. Three Pers-Armenians, who held command in Persian service, deserted for Constantinople, where they were received by one of their countrymen, Narses, who currently held the office of Count of the Privy Purse, who would later become famous for military exploits. Meanwhile, Justinian still wanted peace, and towards the close of 530, he sent an ambassador to negotiate with Kavod. The Persian king seemed open to the idea, but he still complained bitterly of the responsibility of guarding the Caspian gates, and also that the fortress of Dara was a constant threat to his frontier. Either, said he, let Dara be dismantled or pay an equitable sum towards the upkeep of the Caspian gates. An agreement couldn't be reached, and Kavad dismissed the Roman ambassadors. The Persians had plans for another campaign in which they meant to sack the great city of Antioch. They passed through the province of Euphratesia, the province above Syria, which the Romans were not expecting. Their army consisted of 15,000 cavalry, augmented by their Arab allies. The news was relayed to Belisarius at once, who was still at Dara, and he proceeded to shadow the raiders. Belisarius moved so quickly that he forced the enemy to make a stand at Gabuli, but the Persians, wary of a pitched battle, decided instead to retreat back to Persia. Belisarius was more than happy to let them leave Roman territory, and he intended to shadow the Persians until they were safely over the border. We turn to Procopius for what happened next. But the army began to insult them, not in silence nor with any concealment, but they came shouting into his presence and called him weak and a destroyer of their zeal. And even some of the officers joined with the soldiers in this offense, thus displaying the extent of their daring. And Belisarius, in astonishment at their shamelessness, changed his exhortation and now seemed to be urging them on against the enemy and drawing them up for battle, saying that he had not known before their eagerness to fight, but that now he was of good courage and would go against the enemy with a better hope. On Easter Eve, the Romans overtook the Persians, and the two armies were encamped in sight of each other. That Sunday morning, Belisarius drew his army up in the order of battle. Although the Romans outnumbered their enemy, the Persians managed to inflict a brutal defeat on the Romans. If Belisarius had a weakness as a military commander, it was that he never fully gained the full commitment and trust of the men that he led, especially his officers. In this instance, he was correct in that a battle wasn't necessary, and he should have held firm on this point, but he didn't and suffered a major defeat. Soon after the battle, Justinian recalled Belisarius to Constantinople and ordered him to prepare for a different war that he was now planning. 
In the meantime, an event occurred that produced an immediate change in the relationship between the two empires. Early in September 531, Kavod suddenly became ill. He summoned his favorite son, Khosro, and crowned him at his bedside. And a few days afterwards, he finally expired at the age of 82, in the 44th year of his reign. Khosro, not yet secure in his throne, decided a foreign war wasn't what he wanted at that time, and sent signals to Rome that he was ready to deal. He still felt strong enough to impose exacting conditions on the Romans. Since most of the fighting took place on Roman soil, he believed that they were the losers. Justinian agreed to all of the terms, and a treaty was ratified under the reassuring title of the Eternal Peace. In this agreement, Dara was not to be demolished, but the Magister Militum had to remove his headquarters from there and transfer it west, away from the frontier. The Caspian Gates were to be left in sole charge of Persia. The Romans agreed to pay an indemnity of 110 centenaries of gold. No small amount of glory had accrued to the Romans, but they lost a substantial amount of material wealth, accruing for the most part to the Persians. On the Illyrian frontier, the Romans were in almost perpetual conflict with barbarian raiders. A man named Mundus, a Gepid, was made Magister Militum of the West. He had formerly been in service to Theodoric the Great, but upon his death, he offered his sword to Justinian, to whom he proved a faithful servant. Not only in defense of Illyricum, but also in the capital of Constantinople, where the relations between the people and their sovereign were reaching a boiling point. In the next video, Justinian will face his greatest challenge yet. Stay tuned.